Hello, welcome everyone to the Work From Home Show. I'm your host, Nikki Weisgarber, and my guest today is an experienced and accomplished organizational leader. He's an inspiring speaker and writer, and somehow he finds the time to do consulting and coaching services through um, his business, Work Feels Good. Welcome, Tom Warren. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for, ha- thanks for uh, joining us today. I'm, I'm, you have a very interesting background and you have a very interesting, we have an interesting conversation that I definitely want to dive into. And, um, but first I want uh, to talk a little bit about um, your background because it's interesting. So mm-hmm. share with me in the audience, um, what were the, the major milestones that led you to where you are today in your career? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I find everybody, once you start talking to them, has a very interesting background and everybody's had their own challenges and continue to have those. But mine, uh, I've always, you know, when I was younger, I always kind of had a, I see it now as a little bit of a problem with work and really work, you know, helping people with work is what I do now. So when I was uh, quite young, I, uh, I uh, joined the military. My father had been in the military and this is many years ago. Um, but it, I always felt the job wasn't quite the right thing for me, but I really didn't know what else I should do. Um, I progressed quite well uh, in it, but um, one day when I was deployed uh, overseas in the former Yugoslavia uh, in a war zone, there was a a mortar attack and uh, nobody was uh, injured or killed that day. Um, But uh, when that happened, it kind of jarred me into thinking, you know, I'm doing something this career that really isn't right for me. Like I really didn't want to die immersed in a career that wasn't right for me. And you'd think that after something like that, you would think about something else other than your job or work, you know, all kinds of stuff, but no work was on my mind. So about a year after that, when, when we all got back to Canada, I, uh, I got out of the military and um, only job I could find was uh, in Western Canada at that time was working on a drilling rig. Um, when that, uh, that was going okay for it was good money for a year. And then uh, there was a, an accident and somebody yelled something. I jumped out of the way. And if I hadn't have jumped out of the way, I would have been pretty much sheared in half at the waist um, by a large piece of metal hitting a pipe. And uh, again, when that happened, um, I thought, yeah, you know, another close call. I need to find a safer job. And uh, that was almost 20 or 25 years ago. I went back to school, um, got a great job in a high rise in downtown, advanced in my career, traveled all over the world. Uh, But I really wasn't happy again. I still wasn't feeling fulfilled in my work. I was, you know, in charge of millions of dollars, managing teams. Um, So I started mountaineering uh, as a kind of a distraction from work. And I did it with my wife and friends and we had a great time. Uh, but my first big mountaineering trip was to uh, Peru and at about 18,000 feet on a mountain there I got very sick and uh, started to hallucinate uh, stopped breathing all because of the altitude and thought I was gonna die Uh, of course uh, my you know I kind of snapped out of it in a way my climbing partners helped me we got back to base camp but uh, that was probably the low point in my life and that was uh, 2008 because uh, my work had already lost meaning and now my escape from work uh, lost meaning too. And I really didn't know what to do. I was just lost. Um, but instead of getting too lost, I uh, started reading, uh, going back to school, trying to understand you know, this thing called work and life and you know, the power of close calls and death in our lives. And uh, I eventually uh, uh, figured a few things out, um, started a consulting business uh, the first one, uh, after I kind of sorted my own perspective on work out, uh, started helping initially organizations uh, engage their teams more, and then individuals uh, and leaders, uh, you know, be more engaged in their individual jobs. And uh, yeah, that's progressed to where I am today. So it's my, uh, my new work is about work and, yeah. uh, and leadership. <laughs> and it's, a, it's been a wonderful time. Well, tell me a little bit about your consulting business then. Um, and, you know, the, um, obviously I want to get into what is the, um, the uh, you know, most common um, challenge that is arising from, from, from leaders right now that you're seeing mm-hmm. with, with the pandemic. 
Um, and let's elaborate a little bit on what advice you've given them um, mm -hmm. to support them in these times. Yeah, so uh, outside of a crisis, um, there's always uh, challenges with uh, particular problems, new, new problems that come up with leaders. Remember that most people are always there to do their best work and uh, they want the best for the people they work with, but obviously there's unique problems that come up and if you can help leaders solve those problems, then they can replicate that in the future. So that's, that's pretty steady, you know, uh, a pretty steady uh, form of work and something that's always necessary. But when the, when the pandemic hit, um, leaders were all of a sudden given a ton of extra work that nobody saw coming. So all this planning, um, you know, some organizations have to, had to deal with massive restructuring and layoffs. And what leaders have found, uh, my client base and new clients that have reached out, is they just don't have the time anymore to lead their teams, but they know how important it is to lead their teams. So it really is right now, if you're a leader in an organization and you've got, you know, whether it's, um, you know, five to 15 individual contributors reporting to you, or you're a leader of leader, leaders, you've really got maybe, and, and this is not uncommon, five minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, maybe you've got half an hour a day to engage with these people that look to you to support, um, uh, and where you used to have maybe had hours per day to do that. So it's really the time to be a leader that has changed in this time of crisis. Yeah, so time, that's, that's interesting because, um, you know, when you're at the office, you're more tangible. So that's how, um, you know, we've kind of described it at Kudos is we were more tangible as leaders. So you could just walk over to my desk and ask me a question, but now you can't necessarily do that. So I'm not mm -hmm. as tangible. Um, and, you know, I don't know that I've been given a lot of uh, extra tasks to do, but I feel like there's more meetings. So mm -hmm. maybe that is a task, <laughs> but I feel like there's more meetings happening because we aren't connecting at the office. We aren't as tangible. Um, so then that does feel like I do, do have less time uh, available in the day to, to support the team or even to do, um, you know, the, the bigger projects that I'd like to work on or that the team would like to work on. So, you know, what would help their, what would help the leaders, um, uh, you know, thrive uh, mm -hmm. during these times of working remotely? And why do some of them struggle? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm glad you mentioned the, uh, the more meetings thing, uh, because uh, the trend that we've seen recently is, and, and, it's, and it's amazing that we have the uh, communication tools to do that, is that we've scheduled a lot more uh, meetings uh, to make sure we're connected. And that's chewing up time. We're back in the office. I'm sure that um, when, you were, when you were at your desk, people would pop in or you could pop by. And it was very informal. And it seemed not to be dedicated half hour, 15 minutes here or one hour. So I think um, if, if I could offer uh, one piece of advice that seems to be working right now is, and, and I know this goes against what people are doing and what we think is right, is to actually really cut back on the uh, scheduled uh, meetings that we're having with our team to engage them and find ways to almost have an open door or a time during the day. So there's tech, well, we all know about the technology and there's, there's, you know, there's all kinds of remote, uh, remote working technology, but also team working technology that, that we can say, you know, for this, hour or this two hours or for the entire afternoon, you'll be able to instant message me or, you know, just press a uh, voice call and we'll be able to chat and we don't have to start with any uh, introduction. We don't have to do any of that. I'm just open during these times. And if you've got a minute that you need or two minutes, just text me or whatever. So it's almost stepping away from that, uh, that, that the opinion structured. that we yeah, yeah, that structure that, you know, we think now, oh my God, I've got to really reach out to my team and make sure everybody, you know, feels included and, and mm -hmm. seen and heard. And I'm going to schedule meetings with each of them. We've, we've seen in the last three weeks that is just not sustainable. So we need to go back to informal kind of open door, bump, bump into each other in the hallway mm -hmm. kind of interaction. Yeah. 
Um, I tried this last week with my team and, and it's something at Kudos that we've, we've implemented, which is remote co-working. Mm. And I did this with my team last week. And I said between, you know, uh, one and four, I'm going to open up my Zoom link pop in if you have questions. So it's like we're, you know, just popping by my desk to ask me a question. And that seemed to work really well. Um, and I got a good response uh, from the team on it um, because it's like they would be coming to my desk to ask me a question. So just opening up the Zoom link even and, and just um, having that open door policy. Um, and then that way you're still incorporating um, that tangibility that you would have had at the office um, when, you were, when you were there. Um, so, you know, what you're, what you're mentioning is kind of, you know, um, going against what everybody else has been kind of saying, which is, you know, book more meetings, you know, do your team huddles in the morning, you know, can check out at the end of the at the end of the day. Um, but I do find that it does block uh, too much time in my schedule um, to get other tasks completed as well. So um, but it's kind of interesting how people have different opinions uh, on how to approach that. Um, but mm -hmm. I think, that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, what you've done, what you did uh, yesterday and is exactly, I think, what we need to do more of. And even if we don't want to have our Zoom camera on, we can, mm -hmm. you know, we can turn the video off. But as long as the audio is on, you can hear somebody knock on your door virtually and say, oh, I just got a quick question for you. So, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah it's worked out well. So I, I, I'm going to do that more often, I think. <laughs> So if, if leaders want to sort of like level up um, their remote, remote leadership game, um, what are some things that they can do um, uh, to kind of level that, level that up a bit? Yeah, and uh, I've, I've kind of put this idea out there that's, and it's been known for, for decades, but I kind of emphasized it in the last few days, is that, um, you know, outside of a crisis, any crisis, uh, we'll often uh, tolerate and forgive uh, the odd bit of bad behavior or less than less than ideal behavior from our from our from the people we work with, but during a crisis, everybody's kind of nerves are a little raw, and um, things hurt a little more. And I'm not saying they should hurt in the first place, but some things affect people a little more. So the old saying is, people will tolerate and forgive missteps and misbehavior outside of a crisis, but they'll always remember how you treated them in a crisis. And if, if leaders can just, and there's, I'm not saying all leaders have to do this because there's brilliant people that are already self-aware and very careful of communication. But even, even the people who are most aware of how they impact others have to be a little hyper-vigilant to that right now. And that doesn't mean we can't make hard decisions and have difficult conversations, but we just have to be aware that the, the default behavior that we have uh, might be uh, might not be ideal right now. So if we can just up our game by being a, a little more aware that that people are a little raw right now, nerves are a little raw. I think that's the first part of leveling up. And we all know that self awareness is one of the most important qualities a leader can have. So mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so. Um, this hasn't come up in any of the conversations that I've had um, on these little mini podcasts, and I'm 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 interested to hear your your response. But how can teams support their leaders? Yeah, and I think uh, so. That's something that uh, I had a conversation with uh, a few uh, individual contributors recently. I I, I still do uh, quite a bit of coaching during this time, and I've actually uh, tried to offer and make it more accessible during this time. So people who are uh, or having difficulties, a lot of them can now just chat with me for free. And I, I really want to do that. They've supported me in this a long time. So I had a few conversations with people that are um, quite um, anxious right now. And um, I think we have to balance between what we would like, the support we'd like to have from our leaders and the support we really need so we all, as leaders need to be more self-aware of how their default behavior in, impacts other people, we also have to be a little generous and kind uh, to leaders with the reassurance, security, and uh, certainty that we need more of in this time. So if we need three times the, the reassurance right now, I mean, settle for double if that makes sense, because um, we need a lot more, uh, but people are only to provide 
able to provide so much more. Maybe not everything we need right now. And that's not a reflection on the leaders. And it doesn't mean that we're needy. It's just a, a time thing again. And, uh, and there's so much going on. So if we can, uh, you know, take the foot off the gas a little bit on what we expect from our leaders, uh, that gives them a little more room to perform at their best. Uh, people do not, um, you know, stress, uh, people always say, uh, you know, people often perform their, their best under stress. Well, only in certain conditions. Stress can really uh, exacerbate or expose behavior that would, we'd, ne we'd never see in times of stress. So the more we stress our leaders, it's possible that the, uh, the behavior that we get in return might always be ideal. So if we can just maybe back off a little, Mm -hmm. That helps. Yeah. I think it's it's important too. I think that there is a lot of pressure on leaders to support their teams. And mm -hmm. I think we need to think about it inversely as well. Like how can I support my leader mm -hmm. um, to make sure that they're okay and check in with them and sure. you know be empathetic to their situations as well, especially, you know, during um, you know, a crisis or a pandemic like we're experiencing, um, mm -hmm. that we're experiencing now. Yeah, and I thank you for bringing that up because I was more focused on time, but you're absolutely right. Uh, from from a, just a, a human to human perspective, the empathy and support that we all have, for, should always have for each other, uh, that's, that's a brilliant uh, uh, insight for how we can support our leaders. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for that insight. I like it. <laughs> um, so what are some lasting changes to um, leadership that might come out of this current crisis? What do you mm -hmm. see kind of on the other side uh, from, from leadership? Yeah, and uh, a lot of people uh, for years, they've been asking me to say, well, what does the future of work look like in the future of leadership? And I'm always very cautious because I, there's an old saying that predicting the future is a, a mugs game. I'm not sure what mugs game means, but it's almost mm -hmm. like a losing game. Like we never seem to get it right. But uh, there is there's one thing that uh, I, I'm seeing uh, in the organizations and individuals I'm working with. And uh, that is the difference between a self-starter an autonomous worker, and there seems to be a new uh, worker emerging. So we all know what self-starter means. People, uh, you can put them in a role, they'll, uh, they'll figure out what has to get done, they'll learn how to do it, and they'll start doing it. Uh, people who are more autonomous uh, typically don't need uh, some sort of intervention to continue with their role. But what we're seeing now is that um, we have people working very hard out there uh, that is very much aligned with the expectations, vision, mission, values of their organization and, and their, the expectations that have been set with respect to performance in their role. And they seem to be doing that without a lot of leadership, traditional, and I mean traditional like three months ago, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> leadership intervention. So I think the, the, uh, the worker that is... Uh, kind of rising to the uh, to our awareness now are the ones that we can count on to really understand what the organization needs, understand the performance expectations of the role, and just seem to be able to do that with, with minimal leadership uh, intervention and oversight. And I don't think that, um, that that will at all ever reduce the requirement to the number of leaders in an organization, but it'll help us, um, uh, you know, determine uh, which person is right for a role because we'll, we'll start to see if they can work without leadership, and mm -hmm. work with, you know, immediately understand the goals and expectations of the organization and, and integrate those into their behavior. So I think what all that, that will happen is we'll continue to see the, the role of leader evolve and, uh, and, you know, perhaps uh, redirect towards people who may need more support. So I think this, and I haven't figured out what to call this, uh, this new kind of self-inspired uh, worker. Right? We, we use self-directed and autonomous, but it's almost like a, a self-inspired. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we see it emerging. There's so many people doing such good work yeah. uh, at home without a lot of contact with their teams and, mm -hmm. and their leadership. And uh, yeah, I think we should really acknowledge that. 
Yeah, I think that we are all learning something new about ourselves as well during these times. Um, you know, whether that's good or bad or, you know, whatever it might be, I think we're all learning something new about how we work or how we manage our time, how we manage work-life balance. I think we're, we're all, um, you know, learning uh, throughout this whole process. And I, I've learned many things about myself, <laughs> having two children at home and trying to work. Um, and I'm sure a lot can relate out there. Um, but yeah, I think you, this is, um, a good way uh, to learn something new about your leadership style or about your, um, you know, your work ethic in general. I, I, I agree. And uh, maybe, maybe that's what we'll, uh, we'll agree to call this, uh, you know, these, these people, maybe yes. the self-inspired worker, it'll probably something come up something better on social media <laughs> tomorrow, but yeah. Yeah, I really think, uh, I really think that's a real positive, you know, and I know there's big challenges out there and a lot of, grief and sadness, but maybe that's one of the positives that are coming mm -hmm. out of this with respect to the world of work. Yeah. So still kind of talking a little bit about, you know, the future and, and when we look at the other side of this pandemic and when we're ready to go back to work, um, what advice can you provide organizations, leaders, and even employees on how to better prepare for, I guess, mm -hmm. what we're calling it day one for the right. day that we have to transition from working remotely to going back to work? Absolutely. And, and of course, there's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll first say, say that of not being a medical expert or anything like that, I'm sure there'll be all kinds of uh, uh, challenges with respect to the social distancing still. But it, when it comes to the world of work, um, I think we're starting to see that people who used to call themselves introverts or said, I don't really... Uh, need to interact that much at work. Because remember, one of the primary motivations for work is social connection. And that's, you know, that's one of the most researched topics in academia, uh, self-identity, social connection, and survival are kind of the three reasons people work. But we're finding that people need more s social connection than they ever thought they mm -hmm. had. So as we move back into day one, there's a lot of talk about maybe not as many will move back into the office, you know, save on, there's a reduced environmental footprint with respect to, you know, fossil fuels and other energy. Mm -hmm. There's a reduced real estate footprint and the cost that goes along with that. So maybe more can work from home. And uh, I agree with, I agree with that, uh, you know, the logic of that, but work as a primary means of social connection will still be there. So I think as we move towards and into day one, I think we're going to be less focused on, can everybody, is everybody still motivated to do their job? I think we've already checked that box. Mm -hmm. Does everybody have the technology to do their job? We've kind of checked that box. But um, yeah, what are we going to do about uh, the new social connections we'll do in the workplace and how we're going to connect in general if we ever have more people working from home or we have to go back to working from home on a second or third wave. I think it's really understanding the social connection. I'll just toss in one more thing. Yeah. Um, Gallup being one of the largest research organizations, uh, their, one of their surveys um, talks about one of the 12 things we people say they need at work for engagement. And one of them is a best friend at work. And there's a huge mm -hmm. bunch of research about best friends at work. And a lot of us, when we look back in our lives, especially my life is very, uh, focused on, on work. Uh, most of my uh, most uh, enduring and deep social relationships were initiated in the workplace. So I think we're day one is going to be all about social connection, not so much about technology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, do we are we motivated to do our work? Yeah. So to be better prepared, are you saying for those social connections, maybe we should throw a big party on day one <laughs> and kind of get it out of our system? And <laughs> yeah, uh, I think big parties are going to be a, a while away, but I, I really think to be prepared for day one, organizations need to focus on how are we going to nurture and mm -hmm. sustain social relationships starting on this new day one, because day one will be different than day to day mm -hmm. right day to day yes. we're working many people for, if we're fortunate enough to work remotely that's different but if we start trickling back into the office and there's some people in the office some at home and perhaps there's a, a mix of schedules um i think we really need to start focusing on building social connection we're still in the 
you know, we're just starting, just probably getting out of the how do we survive working from home. We haven't really talked about how do we really uh, implement this need for social connection in the workplace. Many organizations are just getting over the technology hub, mm -hmm. just getting over the work planning hub. It's, it's time to really start focusing on real social connection at work. Yeah, agreed. And, and you know, the, I explained it this week. I think last week was probably the, the hardest week for myself um, because the adrenaline has worn off. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's, this is, okay, yeah, I'm in, I'm in kind of reality for the moment. And I don't know what, how long this reality is going to last. Um, so I think last week was really tough for me uh, because, you know, just trying to figure out our technology and how we're going to connect, although we already had a lot of uh, our tech stack in place and, and we were working remotely here and there uh, anyway, so we were well set up for that. But it's just very different. That social connection is extremely important to me, mm -hmm. especially as an introvert. <laughs> That's one thing I've learned about myself. Right. Um, I still deeply need those social connections, even though I am, you know, identified as a, a, an introvert. Um, isn't, yeah, that, isn't that incredible though? Mm -hmm. So imagine us, and uh, I, I'm a, a bit of an introvert, so is my wife and a lot of our friends. And uh, we've realized that, yeah, this, this thing for social connection is so powerful in our mm -hmm. lives. And we're reaching out where before we would have said, oh, that's the extrovert thing, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I have a, some extrovert friends who were like, you know, um, they're okay with working from home. They're like, I love this. This is the best thing ever. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> so it is kind of interesting to see, you know, the different personalities kind of come out and um, yeah. So before we kind of get into some of our wrap up questions, did you want to leave our audience with any, you know, takeaways or some other tips or tricks that you have up your sleeve? Yeah. Um, so with respect to working from home, working from home or just for leaders, yeah. um, just kind of getting through this time. Yeah. There, there's one choose. thing. <laughs> yeah. There, there's one thing that, uh, so it's great to, to, you know, ch ch chat about this and, uh, but, I really like people to be able to, you know, leave with something very tangible that they can they can say. Well, how can I implement this tomorrow? And of course, when I speak and and things like that, there's always a you know people can download stuff from my website as free handouts. There's one thing that uh, I did a, a few months ago. I think it was about 20. Uh, sorry, uh, might have been in 2018. But um, I really uh, it was really helpful for my clients, and it's still available as a free download on workfeelsgood.com if you go to the resources section. And it really is just a two by two matrix on leadership style and the time it takes to do it. So for example, leaders today, when they have five minutes with their team, if that's what happens or five minutes with one person, in that moment, they may have to decide, do I just tell somebody what needs to be done? Do I you know, in, uh, continue or embark on a longer term mentoring kind of relationship? Mm -hmm. Do I coach them? Or is this one of those tasks that unfortunately I just have to roll up my sleeves and do it myself? Each one of those approaches is a, a, a valid uh, decision to take depending on the circumstances and the time you have in that, in that moment. And I've kind of laid that out on a time versus leadership chart, free download, no strings attached. Um, and I think that's been very helpful. And each one of those, like I say, each one of those approaches uh, is definitely appropriate and, you know, is, is largely time-based and criticality-based. And it all started, uh, if we look at the most critical situations, like people in uh, first responders, military, for, you know, frontline medical workers now, sometimes in the moment, people just need to be told what to do or they'll just say, let me do it, I'll get out of my way, I got to get it done. Uh, when life and death situations, that's necessary. Um, and also, if we've got a new worker in the workplace that we want to mentor for six months or a year, that's the other uh, kind of extreme of time. But there's all kinds of things in between that we can do. And, and that's what I've tried to do in that download. So I hope that little tip, people are comfortable just downloading it and pasting it on their wall and emailing it to friends because it, it seems to have helped quite a few people. Yeah. And when I was... Um you know, doing a bit of research on, on you and, and your, your topics and stuff. I did come across that, uh, the visual on your website and I downloaded it. So oh, thank you. <laughs> I will be resurfacing that to, uh, further, 
you know, do a bit more research on that because I think that's, you know, I think those, those four pieces that you highlight there are all the pieces that, you know, leaders need to look at and, and recognize, but how much time are we spending in each of those and, and how can we allocate the right amount of time to each of those areas? Oh, thank you. I, I hope it's helpful. <laughs> yes, thank you. All right. So uh, kind of leading into our wrap up questions here. What is your number one work from home tip, whether that's professional or uh, personal or maybe a hybrid? Well, the number one work from home tip, tip for me is keep moving. <laughs> so what I found when I first started working from home, and I think I'm in year two now, I mean, really working from home where I'm speaking and writing. So the only work uh, getting out of the, the my home office would be when I travel to speak or meetings with clients. Um, and then occasionally it'd be a few weeks in the workplace, but it w wouldn't be uncommon for me to work from home, you know, five, seven days straight. Um, and without any distractions. Back then I was the only one at home. It wasn't uncommon for me to not move for four or six hours from my computer. And when I go to move, I was in pain and mm. stiff. So I started setting uh, alarms on my phone. So there's an alarm on my phone, it's muted right now. It goes off every half an hour. And in that, when it goes off, I will stand up. Even if I have nothing to do, I will go get a drink of water. Uh, I will bring in the garbage bins from the street. I will sweep off my deck. I will, and of course I've got my, ed my exercise scheduled outside of that. But if you can just move every half hour, 25 minutes, makes a huge difference to your well-being. Um, I was on the point of developing some repetitive strain injuries from being on the computer mm -hmm. for that period, you know, such a long time. And uh, yeah, moving has changed that for me. And I'm so glad I developed that habit now because I don't think I'll be getting out of the house for a, a few more weeks. Yeah, <laughs> I um. I, I'm like, you know, I'll sit at my computer and I'll just head down work. And before you know it, yeah, four or five hours has passed and oh, I'll yeah. be like, Oh, I'm so cold. I'm going to turn the heat up in here, but it's, and I have no, no, you know, circulation happening in my body. So of course I'm cold. Uh, but it's kind of funny. I'm like blaming it on the furnace. I'm like yelling at my husband, do you turn the furnace down? It's freezing in here. He's like, how about you get up from your desk? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I'm like, yep. Good tip. Um, is there anything that you're, you're currently binge watching, whether that's on Netflix or uh, Crave, maybe yeah, it's the um, Disney Plus channel? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I've always been a reader, but uh, I, I do uh, enjoy uh, a break from reading and, and thinking. So what uh, it's going to, you know, we're, we're always, you know, a little nervous about telling people what we binge watch, but mm -hmm. uh, I probably watch three or four episodes of the big bang theory mm -hmm. every night and that's my kind of little secret mm -hmm. um I, I have all 12 seasons and i'll i do i've been doing that for for it's, it's embarrassing for years and <laughs> i'll get to the end of season 12 <laughs> and i'll start over at season one the pilot again and it'll take me a few months to get through it and i just keep doing that and it's just a a real break for my brain mm -hmm. so that's my little thing and it's I know I tell friends and they say, when are you going to stop watching the show? It's like, I just can't. Yeah. No, it's good to have that. Like, it's good to have that one show that you can always go back to. I have many of them that I watch over and over. Um, Gossip Girl is one of them. That's oh, yeah. embarrassing. So <laughs> that also really dates me. Um, but um, there are just certain shows that I like. I think it's because it's those, uh, it reminds me of specific times in my life too. Uh, so going back to Gossip Girl is when it was in my early 20s and, you know, going to university. Um, so I think it, it just, it just brings back some good memories. But um, since you read a lot and, yeah. uh, you know, have a lot of uh, learning resources probably um, at hand here, are there any particular books or podcasts or learning resources that you can suggest for mm -hmm. leaders who want to continue developing their their skills while they're working from home? Yeah, I mean, uh, when it comes to uh, books about leadership, I um, th there are a few out there that I think are, are, you know, obviously, there's a lot of books out there that are helpful. But I always ask um, leaders to most of the books I recommend, recommend to leaders uh, help them shift their their uh, their thinking in general and there's one that I've, I've recommended for I don't know how many years 10 years now I think and it's um, it's called the art of possibility and it's uh, by uh, 
uh, Ben and Rosamund Zander. Uh, it says, it's, it was, uh, it's, what happened is the Harvard School of Business went to the arts community and said, can you write a book on business for us? And Benjamin Zander was the uh, this conductor of the uh, Boston uh, Symphony and his wife Rosamond is a psychologist. And uh, they wrote this amazing book that has 11 um, kind of reframes, 11 things that we can do to look at the world differently. And it's been one of the most helpful books for me. It, uh, it inspired me after my, uh, after my mountaineering accident. Uh, about two years after that, I, I read that uh, book and it, it, it's one of the ones that really helped me. And I uh, hope, you know, just to plug my own book right here, Work Feels mm -hmm. Good, uh, sorry, the, Your Best Work. Um, I think a lot of books like the Xander's book have really uh, come through in how I show up every day. And I'm just so, I'm so happy that some, some organization like the Harvard School of Business reached out beyond uh, the business community and, and, and to find artists who could write something about business and leadership. And they did an amazing job. It's, a, uh, it's been a bestseller for years, but I, want, I don't think too many people are aware of it. So it's the art of possibility. Art of possibility. I'm going to mark that down for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, so what is, what is one positive thing um, you have seen since our social distancing started that you always want to remember? Well, we, we were talking uh, yesterday afternoon about this with some friends. As soon as, um, and, and you, I know you've probably done this, many other people have done this, we, we initiated Zoom group calls, uh, Zoom cocktails with friends. Uh, mm -hmm. Last week, uh, last weekend, my wife and I had a uh, Zoom movie night with a friend. Mm -hmm. uh, she was watching it in her house. We watched it in ours and we, we, uh, we had intermissions and we chatted about the movie, texted throughout it. Um, Yesterday on the, on the on on a Zoom call, we we were talking about how we actually don't want this to end. We have to go out of our way to have these weekly connections, these Zoom calls. We're talking with scheduled chats with friends every week that sometimes we didn't see for six mm -hmm. months. Yeah, and it's been wonderful, and I I hope that's one positive that continues. That's great. Um, I've experienced that too. I just, there are friends that I haven't seen in months and I have a lot of other good friends that still live in Saskatchewan uh, where I'm from and I've connected more with them since this time than I did, you know, not having zoom or having, you know, the scheduled time to chat. Um, and it's been really good to connect with them because I haven't spoke to them uh, or seen them in quite some time. So, um, I, I, I'm completely on board with continuing these zoom calls going forward. It's great. Well, Tom, I appreciate your time today. It's been a great conversation and you have some great insights and I do encourage uh, the audience to go take a look at your website, pick up your book um, and take a look at some of the resources that you have available. Um, Thank so you. thanks again. Yeah, it's been a great experience and uh, all the best to uh, uh, you, your family and everyone uh, at the podcast and at Kudos. It's been a, a genuine pleasure to be here. Great. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. thanks everyone for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast for future episodes. Give us a five-star rating if you like the show. And until next time, stay wise, stay connected, and stay healthy.